So, glad to be with you. Welcome to the Indigenous Language Institute's Web Symposium Series. I'm Mara Du Studi, ILI board member and your moderator. Today's presentation will featuring Gerald Hill will last approximately one hour. After the presentation, we will take a 10 minute break before starting the Q&A session. During the break, keep this window open. Do not leave the webinar, you cannot be readmitted. To submit a question, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered during the Q&A session after the break. And now, may I present Gerald Hill. Oh, good morning. I'm happy to uh, be here with you and uh, share my presentation, which is really uh, an experience of my experiences over the years in acquiring um, my own language of Oneida. Jerry Hill, the young Yats of Sunigeha. Some of the things that I want to talk about uh, in three parts here are a book that we published in ILI. It's uh, how do I say? I don't remember the exact year we did this. Uh, I first came on uh, ILI in uh, 1997. It's really kind of a long time ago, but it's gone. Um, fast and we evolved from um, uh, what we started to be, which is uh, generally to help preserve the languages of the Americas. And uh, we changed our name to Indig Indigenous Language Institute because it was easier to say and easier to remember. Uh, this book, is one of the things that I think that is kind of a masterpiece. It was preceded by uh, another uh, project we had. I think it was uh, something like um, uh, a clearinghouse of different language programs of all, well, as many of the uh, nations and communities that we could have and their contact information so that we could share. And that was something. This was more, uh, this book was more of a, um, not exactly how to, but it's something along the lines of trying to get to the essence of what it is that we're all after, which is um, using what we have and what we've developed, including our shared experiences in acquiring our languages. And we uh, sat down uh, a number of times and put this together um, partially as a way of uh, fundraising, but more importantly, it was to uh, try to get focused on how to develop uh, useful language. And there's uh, not really a lot of uh, analysis that goes into the book. Uh, I'm talking about linguistic analysis, uh, grammatical rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's based on the need to uh, use the language, and so I consider it a kind of a development of vocabulary in various uh, areas. And you know, I think we've seen this in other um, books on language acquisition where we talk about kitchen talk and weather talk and uh, different areas like that. And from one of our earlier presenters, I uh, learned the word, um, uh, I can't even think of the word now. Um, anyhow, various areas in which we would uh, uh, have specialized vocabulary and that might be uh, profession, it might be about sickness, it might be about tools, it might be uh, uh, many different kinds of things that we used to talk about. And I think uh, when I was uh, doing this, my uh, uh, observation was that 
uh, we're multitasking as soon as we wake up in the morning and start communicating because we have a day ahead of us and lives that we're leading and things that we're doing that require us to talk to whoever else that lives there, um, our families, what we're going to do today, what has to happen later on. And we're constantly changing uh our domains of conversation. That's the word I was looking for, domains. So I look at that as specialized areas in which we uh, talk about things. And when I talk to my brother, we talk about things that he and I are interested in. When I'm talking to my kids, I'm telling them things that we jointly have to do, such as preparing for school and what's gonna go on today. Uh, this book kind of came uh, together with uh, some of the board, some of the staff, and a um, uh, couple other people, I think. I don't even remember how they all came together. But if you get this, if you have this book, it's very valuable. It was intended to be used compatibly with uh, formal classes that may be going on in school. Uh, by individual activists who just have their own uh, agenda and thing that they're doing. Uh, anybody who's interested in their own culture and the reason for uh, having these separate ways of looking at different aspects of the lives that we live in, uh, the lives that we're living. And so I think that if you have a chance, you know, get this and look at it. It's worth, um, it's really worth it. I've I've uh, shared it with a number of different people. I don't know if they just uh, just stack it around or something like that. You know, we do that with things that uh, we think will be useful. And sometimes we don't always follow through. Uh, I remember when we were starting classes about 20 or 25 years ago, um, we had tape recorders. And then we had television uh, cameras. And now we're down to our cell phones that do all that stuff. And sometimes we don't use it to the full capacity. I mean, I know we have, uh, you have to learn how to use it. Then you have to have a purpose uh, in mind to use it. And, you know, like we uh, buy a lot of things and don't use them. And that goes from, um, you know, uh, physical exercise equipment to uh, cameras that we're gonna use to record uh, uh, people and things that they say, etc. And I think that this book is kind of along those lines. If you use it and if you're interested in just the thoughtfulness of the language behind uh, the reason for doing it at all, it's helpful. Uh, recently, there was a presentation from ANA by um, Tahini Pete. Uh, he's presented at our other conferences. We've had a very nice man. And he went through the various kinds of um, uh, teaching methodologies that are available, including uh, commercial uh, presentations of people that tell you how you can um, acquire your language. And I think that uh, all of these things are helpful, but I think the only time they really work is if you actually get into it and start doing it. So the books themselves and the methods themselves are always interesting sounding, but you have to do the work. And I think that nothing substitutes for the work that needs to be done if you're going to acquire a language. And Acquiring a language means thinking a different way. And I think that's what we've tried to do with this book is to help people think of um, things that are a different way of looking at the world. And uh, for example, uh, one of my teachers, an older man, was asking me about going to Washington. Well, I'm a lawyer and I work for the tribe. and so I would travel there frequently. And uh, he told me uh, one day that uh, he asked me in the language, uh, 
if I was going to Andagalyasni and I didn't know what that meant. And what it means is the place of the destroyer. And that kind of opened up my mind. And I said, why do we call it that? And we said, well, because George Washington was the first destroyer. His title was La Junta Galias. And all the presidents since then have been called La Junta Galias, right down to Trump and uh, now Biden. And I think that uh, some of them we've liked and some of them have been helpful, but some of them have been very destructive. And uh, when I heard that, I was wondering, are we teaching this to our kids in school? Because instead of translating it into it means the president, it don't mean the president at all. It means he's a destroyer. It's a title. That's the title we gave him because of his destructive and perfidious nature in uh, authorizing the Sullivan campaign to wipe out the Iroquois. I said, they were trying to wipe us out. You know, from the beginning, I'm wondering how do I tell my kids and my grandkids now about the Declaration of Independence in which we're um, savage, merciless Indians, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know, in a way, I kind of like that, you know, it kind of like gives me uh, something that at least they were afraid of us at one time. Uh, now we were on to them as far as describing Andagallasne and La Junta Gallas. And these were historical facts that were buried in the language. I think that all tribes probably, uh, I mean, I'm guessing, but I would think all tribes have these kinds of historical uh, metaphors that we can learn from. So there's always that uh, issue of um, what's there, why do this? You know, and to me, the why do this is part of uh, how do we say we're trying to find out things about ourselves, And in doing that, we're trying to find out things about our ancestors. And our ancestors could be very close to us. If we have first language speakers, there are insight, there are access to historical things that mean something to us. And I think that's one of the reasons um, I pushed on with, with uh, some of this. Lord, uh, start the uh, PowerPoint, please. This PowerPoint I developed is really um, for the purpose of, in case I just go blank. Um, you know, I wanted to say something about uh, what we do and why we're doing it and how to make use of this book and lead into the second part of what I think um, it's useful for. Okay, that's the title of the book and this is what it looks like. It was a loose leaf at first and then we had it bound and made it um, a little more easier to use in this way. So it's available through ILI. Next, this was uh, designed as I say to assist teachers and speakers and activists and individuals and anybody that wanted to know about heritage languages in terms of uh, useful conversation. Um, we picked out some uh, categories and domains that we thought were representative, but they're not the only ones. There's many, many things that we can go on um, with this and uh, talk about the different ones. And some of the things that I would talk about are like, groups within the community. It could be just your family. It could be you and one other person. It could be the veterans group. It could be a man's group or a women's group. It can be anything where we share uh, common interest. And one of the things that we got to in doing this was the discussion on what we term survival phrases. And survival phrases were really kind of a starting point for everything. Courtesy phrases, requests for assistance, emergencies, uh, observation, commentary, um, 
maybe life and death, maybe about the pandemic. I mean, that wasn't in existence at the time that we did this, but, uh, you know, I have to say we haven't really talked about it. At least I'm not aware that we've talked about it at home. But I think that all the uh, things we relate to as symptoms and contagion and danger and death are uh, incorporated in this. And so, you know, these would be like a domain of some of the things we're talking about. We can't really escape it. Um, this week, we're going to be having, not we, but I mean, the United States is going to be having a focus on uh, 9-11 and that terrible event uh, people can relate to because like the pandemic, it was just here and you just had to adjust to it. And, uh, you know, the different uh, stories people are telling about it are kind of an example of current events that are going on that as much as we talk about immersion, immersion means all those things. You don't have to like it, but, you know, if you're going to watch TV or you're going to hear people talking, they're going to be talking about this. They're going to be showing pictures of it. They're going to be uh, discussing it. They're going to be discussing Iran. They're going to be discussing the pandemic, but they're also going to be uh, discussing the politics and uh, the various things that are going on. Do the next uh, slide. This is a, a simple book, really. If you browse through it, you'll see things that uh, you may relate to. You may think of other things that are not even here. Uh, the book doesn't focus on uh, linguistic analysis, but it's compatible with the various rules. It's compatible with conjugation drills that can be used compatibly with other methodologies and practices. And, what I mentioned earlier about any system works if you do it. And I think that this is one of those do it kind of a things. Next slide, please. What I want to talk about uh, are innovative projects, independent domains. And I'm going to end my, my, uh, my presentation uh, in a few minutes with a project that I did that was my own um, innovation brought about by the necessity of having to uh, develop a short video on um, an elder speaker, uh, friend, teacher of mine, who was not a uh, public speaker. She was a good speaker and she knew a lot, but she was not the kind of a person that would stand up and make a speech. They would leave that to MCs and moderators and people like me to stand up and whatever it was we're going to say. Uh, she wouldn't do that. And if she wasn't defiant about it. It's just that that was not her personality to stand up and talk about herself. And I really wanted her to talk about herself, but I wanted it to be in a kind of a familiar way to talk about her first experiences with language and how she evolved uh, in her interest in it and kept it for her whole life. And at the age of 92, when uh, I did this video, she had been that, well, that's the essence of a first language speaker. She grew up in our language and she became bilingual at some point later on through boarding school experience and then uh, just living um, and doing many things, but she, I wanted her to be the one to talk about what she did and not herself. And I think there's a kind of a distinction there between uh, bragging about yourself in that way and just uh, describing some of the experiences you've had that led you to this. In the process of doing this, um, we had to do a lot of things. And I think one of the things that I learned in this, when we're doing any kind of a session or a class is the need to warm up. I mean, when we come together, when I get together with my grandkids, um, we're gonna do something and we're gonna sit down and we're gonna play a game. 
and we're warming up. We're going to sit around the table and we're going to do whatever it is we're focused on. And sometimes that's very informal. There's other times when uh, we may feel like uh, doing something a little bit more formal, um, breaking the ice, as uh, some groups call it. But the more familiar you are with it, the more uh, personal it comes to the group. So the groups I'm talking about start off with, as I say, you can be the group yourself, I guess. And another person or a small group of people or um, adult learners are kind of uh, uh, unique because we've been around, we've heard the language, but we never acquired it. And sometimes we're not uh, interested in going to class in the sense of uh, what class means when we go and learn and somebody's trying to teach us, but we still want to talk. And I think that that's the, the idea of doing that. So sometimes it may be just uh, greeting one another, and sometimes it might go as far as being a uh, prayer or something like that, if, if that's how we do it. Whatever it takes to get us in sync before we start the effort of doing this. And maybe it isn't like uh, categories, but we blend into the next uh, sequence of our work. Uh, next slide, please. Some of these things include hobbies and crafts and games. Uh, I recall seeing an old video of some ladies doing a quilt and they were just busy talking away in Oneida. And as I was listening, I couldn't understand them, but I knew that they were having uh, an interaction with each other. They were talking about their work that they were doing and they were also gossiping and they were also joking and teasing. And, you know, there's just a endless information. And I was thinking, what a great way to do that. I mean, if somebody, and I think somebody maybe even them had been in other groups like that themselves and got to listen to people talk, listening to the, uh, to the uh, rhythm of conversation, listening to the highs and lows, listening to what it's supposed to sound like. I think that you don't get that from uh, rules. They don't tell you, you know, when something happens, there's an emotional content that you get from hearing. And so it becomes very critical that we hear people converse and using the language in that way. And it doesn't have to be with that particular matter. But as I went through, I thought, well, you know, games fill that uh, kind of a category. There are informal ways of uh, repetition of counting and turns and procedures and uh, rules of whatever game it is you're playing, uh, not necessarily linguistic rules or phrases. Um, I played Yahtzee with my grandkids because I thought it was pretty easy and Yahtzee kind of sounds like an Oneida word. And we could get into uh, counting and turns and what the rules were and adding and subtracting, which are all kind of minor things when you're in your first language, but when you're getting into another language, you have to acquire those uh, particular um, phrases and uh, vocabulary so that the game can be smooth and have fun until you kind of run out of energy for it. But it was uh, something that I liked doing, and it's only one example. Other people have used other um, examples. I think of, uh, you know, some older friends of mine, my age, that we like to play poker and we had to learn or still have to learn the rules of poker. They seem pretty easy, uh, when you've done it, but putting it in another, uh, context, another language, uh, and then becoming, uh, very familiar with it so that you got it. You're picking up and increasing your language. Veterans groups are the same. Um, 
there's uh, uh, just all kinds of things that come to mind when I'm thinking about the things that we can do. Uh, we're always talking about history. Uh, book discussion groups, I think, are in that same category. It's the commonness of the interest that you share that we want that to be an experience of immersion in our language. I was uh, at, um, in Mississippi, at Choctaw, Mississippi, uh, some years ago, and uh, one of the men there said, you know, like, we already have immersion. He said, the problem with it is that we have English immersion. And when you think about it, we do have English immersion. So uh, to people who would say like, it's going to confuse our kids if we teach our language, that's completely wrong because uh, we're trying to acquire something that's wanting to slip away and we don't have to worry about English. English is all over the place. We're immersed in English, like it or not. A caution I would like to say too in these uh, common interests is that um, sometimes there's uh, specialized things, ceremonial activities, uh, different kinds of uh, categories of confidential information and things like that. Um, I would say, don't do it or avoid doing it unless you have somebody that really knows how to control and talk about it. This is not um, just putting everything up for grabs. It's like learning what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate and learning what you can share and what you should not share. Uh, next, the things that you do, the projects that you make belong to you and you don't have to share them. It's like when you write a poem, it's not a poem for the public until you put it out there and let other people read it and make comments about it, et cetera, et cetera. It's something that you did. And I think that in uh, trying to devise or think about what you would like to do is you think about uh, what it is you want to be, communicate about it. And I think that the way I look at it is Things, if I'm doing something like this, are what I want out of it. When I'm playing a game with my grandkids, I want it to be interesting until we get tired of it. I want it to be uh, something that we can share and something that we don't mind doing again, because we want to be repetitive, but we don't want to get bored. And I think that um, the... Uh, uh, the formality is not necessary in kind of like, let's introduce ourselves, et cetera. It's like, we already know each other. We already have been friends and have done things together or maybe at least done things together. And we have a common interest in trying to acquire a vocabulary that we can share together that bonds us to our ancestors in ways that we need to learn how to share. Next, uh, okay, before I show this, I wanna talk a little bit about um, this lady I mentioned uh, earlier before, her name was Maria Hinton in English. Um, Yageyale is her Oneida name. And she didn't get her Oneida name until she was uh, probably middle-aged woman and uh, that's way later than most of the time we get our names and we wind up with nicknames and various kinds of names. But um, our Oneida names or our heritage names are uh, become very important. And as I mentioned, uh, we were, this was, uh, I think it was 2002. We were doing an honoring in, at a conference that we did in Albuquerque. And uh, I didn't want to stand up and talk about her and just have her sit there. I wanted people to hear her voice and I wanted to hear her express herself in a way that was so natural to her. And, you know, it's a very animated, very nice person. And uh, she became a teacher in 
her older age, uh, I think she was probably in her 60s at the time, uh, she uh, was part of the group of people that started the Milwaukee Indian School. And uh, her and a Ho-Chunk teacher and an Anishinaabe teacher and a Menominee teacher, they got together and they were teaching um, their languages to the different people that uh, people that had removed to Milwaukee. And that became a, a famous school. It's still there and they're still teaching various things. It's an accredited school, and, but that's where she started. At the time, she had no experience. At the time, she had no, uh, I, I want to say, professional experience in teaching. She later on uh, got a teacher's degree, and she also got a recognition from the state, as these other um, teachers had done, of being um, certified to teach the language. Uh, that was the beginning of some kind of regulation that um, became controversial later on because of the fact that there were people that got their certifications that really couldn't talk. I didn't want to get into that kind of controversy. I just wanted to say something about this lady. And of course, I knew nothing, but I was told by uh, my friend and director um, that I had 10 minutes. And I thought, what can I say in 10 minutes? And with my brother, uh, this was several months out uh, of the date of our, uh, our uh, convention. And uh, I determined that I wanted to interview her. And so I went and asked her if she would mind if I uh, interviewed her. And, She's a nice lady. She liked me personally, and she said she would do that for me. And so we sat down, and my brother was able to, because of his connections with a recording studio in town, able to get us some studio time. And we had to be ready when they had a spot. And so we did this in bits and pieces, and I wind up with four hours of interviewing her. And during that time, uh, she told me lots of stuff and uh, I would have to go home at night and transcribe what we said. And it was a very time consuming process. But in the process of doing that, I was able to uh, remind myself that I had spent 10 years with her brother. It was uh, my teacher. I consider him a uh, a very uh, great man, Amos Chris John. Uh, he sat down and he and I had done the language together. Well, in uh, college, I had a degree in linguistics. And in his old age, he is a first speaker, had gone to Lakehead College in Ontario and got a linguistic degree there. And he liked to do the analysis. And so we connected on the analytical part in different ways. I wanted to be a, a learner of my language. He was a first language speaker to begin with. So um, he was his own informant and he was also um, a very nice man who was interested in sharing what he knew with anybody that was interested in. And so we started meeting and uh, I learned how to uh, use the orthography that was developed for our language. And uh, I could write Oneida. Uh, I didn't always know what it meant, but if I heard a word or somebody said something, I could write it down and figure it out or get somebody to help me figure it out. At that time, there were a number of first language speakers that were still around and so, when I started working with Maria on her interviews, I was able to pull that um, training I had from her brother and be able to transcribe what she had said in the language. And I would go over to her house in the morning and we sat and we would 
go over my transcription and review what she was saying on the uh, on the uh, interview. And so that took a long time, but it was it was uh, it was like being tutored by a first language speaker in really uh, minute detail about uh, what she was wanting to say and how she would uh, the different words she would use. And she was uh, very patient and she was really interested in doing this. So what we did, we took this four hours, reminded by Ine telling me that I had 10 minutes. Um, I didn't want to talk about her for 10 minutes, although I could have. And I didn't want her, anybody else to come on and talk about her. I want her to talk. So that, as I've said before, I wanted people to hear her, not me. And so we did this and, you know, really kind of painstakingly, I was able to uh, put it down and use the uh, studio time that I had through my brother's various uh, uh, connections in town. And we got a 10 minute piece on this that I will show you in a minute. Um, one of the things that came out was uh, while we were talking, she started speaking English. And I'm thinking at the time, oh, poop, I'm going to have to go back and do this. But, you know, then I thought, no, I can't do this. I can't go back and say, could you please repeat that? Because that would make it artificial. So I just went on and I did the dubbing of her English part in Oneida with Oneida um, orthography. And I thought, wow, man, that was brilliant. I couldn't have thought of that one myself, you know, I mean, uh, ahead of time. So uh, when she paused, I reminded her to, you know, please speak Oneida. And she just laughed. She thought it was funny. And it was funny. Uh, that humor of hers, uh, you know, kind of came out. Um, we can go on to that next, that next slide. Um, I wanted to say that this was done without outside direction. I did this myself. I wanted to do this. I thought it was important for me as a, well, I wasn't a young man, but I was younger than her, that a man is going to say something good about a woman and he should let her talk for herself. The other thing that I thought was uh, important was that I didn't want to ask for any money to do this. And I think that um, uh, somebody said, well, you should go to the committee and ask them for some money. And I said, I don't want the damn money. I says, if I, get, if I, have, I ask them for money, then I have to tell them what I'm doing. And I have to explain the whole thing. And then they want somebody to check it out. And they're going to. Uh, do this, uh, you know, nonsense of forming a committee, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I don't want them involved. I says, this is my idea and I want to do it my way. Uh, go on to the next, please. And I didn't do it alone, but I kind of wanted to stay focused on, this wasn't about money. Some pe Sometimes people think if we had enough money, we could do this or that. And I'm thinking like, Ideas are stronger than money. If you have a good idea, you'll make it happen. If you have money, you'll probably just squander it and maybe something will happen and maybe it won't. But I had the internal assistance, my brother's connection with uh, uh, professional recording studios, uh, the dubbing of Oneida to English and English to Oneida, the hours of interviewing uh, uh, my subject, Maria, in the language and the transcription and interview and verification of everything that was said. It was uh, uh, very time consuming, but it was, you know, it was like when you get obsessed, it's love. You're doing it because you love it. Next. The uh, editing of the Oneida language, I took out what I considered were the highlights the moments when she said something that I thought was particularly important. 
uh, the story of her life was from when she was a young girl to uh, various boarding school experiences, even to getting her Oneida name as an older person to becoming a formal teacher, a recognized teacher, an author, and an activist herself. And she was always very quiet in doing that, very humble. I think uh, working with her and her brother, I got that, you know, that they were not bragging about what they knew, they were sharing what they knew. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, getting this down from four hours to 10 minutes was something that I was very proud of doing because I made it work and I thought that, but it still wasn't about me. It was just something that I had uh, made happen. And uh, anyhow, when, when we went down, we had, I don't know, there had to be a couple hundred people there and I thought it was uh, very nice and they liked it and I made sure that all the people that were associated with it had copies of the tape at the time and now we have it recorded other ways. Is there another one after this? Yeah, okay, I'm ready to do the uh, Yage Yale uh, project that I did in uh, 2002. Yage Yale. Wadu yawale nika don't slake oko ya jago dum hedu. Government school wa gadaya dan asna to wako shliaku. To yayak na to wako shliaku na sakak don't. Tony ono um. Akte no wa gadaya dan at Tony ono. Nangi ono stu hau slu ni gehwa de pa kadwa nunda. Aki wa kadayata. Chi ni oli jadak na to nikawis. Nangi ono ho slu ni kadwa nunda. Eis. Tone ono e na kui ku loli man pleasant wa kadayata. Jadak deglo kale wadlo. Nikawis. No. Tone oli nik. Ni ways it go. Tony on a hasco, what could have done. Say good day, noon hate ye that lay. Whisk knew us, whisk knew us, the house liago, so he was so wadler. Not the house liago, laxot, laxot house too. Nagy, Lord Leo Slu, Nettiger. Oh, she turned at Leo. Axot ya name on the day. They go, they are down, or down. go walk at lace, Nei to you and Dad touch you night, Kelly Hunyani. Kale Keha. Keha we tiga a patch in Ginoli Asana de Akosliago. Jadak ni we need up chinole asana de akosliago. Nasaya go tawane onoha. Tonyona, da yundasa wa tiga milwaukee, the hundasa wa sagodili hunyani he ungwe hungwe neha. Toga di yayak ni wasa asa de yagaw sliagu. Nagwe wachagun go ji yun dawyan. Jarak ni wasa wadlo ni osla se das. Tone ono ono gunto joslat ha e ah ganadake gana he ha nyak heli huni. Oya su sagodili hunya ni. We had Oscar Archiquid, do you remember Oscar? He he always tried on his own. He'll go pick up children and take them to the parish hall and teach them there, and he takes them home. He didn't have much, but he did that to try to keep the language alive. <laughs> 
Tom Porter was a cojo leji ni wastak. Well, Margie kind of gave me a stiff talking to. She said, "You're always sitting up there." She says, "I want you to come down and take part." She says, "And uh, Tom." Oh no. Look at you. Uh, <laughs> 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 The green yo tiga gu ya kili hunyani it's on ya kili hunyani do kok ni hat ona gu jinate e no kaing o wa ke loli do da so october 12 73 neji igle la dixas hu a hua di li huni Kahyadunk, Kahyadunk, a Hadivan Hnoto. Jinati Yugali Hoyo de Yakio go, Kayad Lok go. Watching your home way. A hoodin, a hunanuk, take it nothing, nothing, need Yugali hood and net mahonis. Segu ya guli hunya ni he la diksa su. As, kae, wis, yaya, jarak, teglu, wadru, oye. Wis ni wasen yaya kchis kale. Chung sana wi ungwe hungwe ne. Kolo kowat ne to tukung sana wi ungwe hungwe ne. I ya he ji a ya ge ya le aksot. Wa ilo kus kanyo nati iyole agi yalak wa ilo kus haksota kasi yalak. Ano, ano kuya kahewe? Ayun kisa ng guadlasios tung ka kuya di dan Canada niya niya hagi. Tunot tunot kaniso ni wa ing. ไม่ยุคสอนกวาดละเสือสตูนิยุคยุคเกลาสิทุธานักเลยวะฮักลีวันดูสิสะสอนนายก็วะกิลตามะฮันอโยลฮันอีกวิ่งกุสอนวะอ
Oarlo, ni o să te gândi te vă gofriază. Da, na, gunu cu neam. Tatu ni gunu cu. Well, I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about anything that I've said today. Um, thank you for your time. So now we will take our short 10 minute break. Remember, don't leave the webinar. Uh, stay in because if you leave, you cannot be readmitted. You can submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So we look forward to seeing you in about two, 10 minutes and uh, seeing uh, what questions you have for Mr. Hill. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. <clears throat> We're ready to start our Q&A. And um, Gerald, if you can unmute, there you are. First, I want to thank Gerald for that incredible presentation and the opportunity to see his um, video again. I count myself very fortunate to have had the opportunity to meet Maria Hinton and uh, she was an incredible woman. So our first question from Julia, and I'm sorry, Julia, I can't see your entire last name, but she asks, what strategies are the best for encouraging speaking within the household? Well, in my opinion, I would say, and, and I've thought of this uh, very often, is use the words you know. I mean, to just do it. If you don't do it, it's never going to happen. And I think that uh, too often we as adult learners want to say something perfect without having gone through the mistakes of just saying, the best we can and doing the best we can. And I think that's where uh, we can learn a lot from uh, children who don't expect an explanation, they just wanna know. And I think that's where we put our brains to work to say like, the way to do it is to just do it. And uh, it sounds easy and it sounds uh, um, simple and I guess in a way it is, but it's so much there right in front of us. I think we'd rather go to rules and explanations and other ways of avoiding just doing it. So to me, the best thing would be if you're around a speaker, listen as much as possible. And if not uh, around a speaker, say what you feel like you know. If you made a mistake, somebody will correct you, that's for sure. Um, and if they don't, then, you know, at some point later on, you will be corrected. And that's the essence of acquisition versus learning. Okay, thank you. Um, so Bonnie Williams asks, how did the Oneida people react to the video? Well, the people that... Uh, watched it that uh, talked to me about it I think they liked it um I know for a fact that we have very uh uh few video um experiences when we're hearing somebody that's a first language speaker to speak conversationally so I think the more that we have the better off we are and um you know whether or not somebody likes it or not is uh, they haven't told me if they don't like it. So I guess everybody loves it like me. Well, I certainly do. Um, and Bonnie Williams also asks, how long did it take to do the whole process? I'm assuming she means uh, producing the video. Well, I think uh, I'm guessing now, I'm not remembering exactly, but when we planned the conference, um, uh, I don't even remember what what time of the year it was, um, but I think it was probably something like uh, 90 days, something around there, because we had to arrange the time and uh, do everything that kind of led up to uh, the sequences of the uh, recordings itself. And then the editing time was 
you know, that was at least a month long because I could only work about a half hour in the evening in transcription. And then the following day, I would go over to Maria's and we would spend the morning reviewing what I had transcribed. And sometimes she didn't remember exactly what she said and we couldn't make it out, but we figured it out together. So it was a, a very nice time to do that. And as it came together, it just kind of fell into place. Everything happened when it was supposed to, and we had it done in time and we had it there for the uh, conference. And I was very happy with it. She was too. Good. Um, I just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions for Mr. Hill, please type them in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, click on Q&A, and then it will bring up a, a like a, a text page where you can type in your questions. Um, Jerry, let me ask you a question. Um, sure. How... Would you recommend that uh, people do something like this to preserve a uh, first speaker, uh, you know, for their own languages? Well, I would think so. I mean, we have no first language speakers now. And uh, so we have to go uh, to Canada to find them. And I think that the more we're around first language speakers, the better chance we have of acquiring the language. The second best part would probably be um, in listening to recordings of first language speakers. And I think that um, doing something like this is something that it's really personal. You know, it has to be something that really you want to do yourself. And uh, you have to kind of have an idea of what you want to get out of it. But, you know, being ready to adapt to whatever happens, I think that uh, all those things went on uh, with me. And then when I tried to update it uh, a couple of years later, I couldn't because whatever insights I had and obsessions I had when I did it weren't there anymore. So, you know, I think it's with any creative person, you always are thinking of the next thing that you can do. And I thought that this would be hoping that it would be the beginning of a library of different things that people would do on their own. Um, just as a comment too, uh, these kind of projects are really wonderful to enlist the help of younger people uh, who may have the technical knowledge that you don't to uh, make a video like this. And um, also expose them to a first language speaker and get them involved in, in uh, preserving their own languages. Um, so uh, Julia had a really good question, but it disappeared, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, she, uh, she asked, how do you get the how do I say workbooks? And it's in the chat that I will, and I think Laura has been posting it but just as a reminder, the How Do I Say Workbook is available from the ILI website. And it's $75 per shipping and handling. And it's really an invaluable tool. I encourage you to, to buy at least one um, because uh, it's really made a difference for a lot of people. Um, Jerry, here's another question. Do your grandkids interact with you in Oneida as much as they can when you're playing together in Oneida? When we're doing those games, yeah, they do, you know, they do what they can. And uh, as much as possible, you know, I try to be responsive. But one of the things that I learned in trying to be the facilitator is that I really don't have enough uh, vocabulary. Um, even when we started playing, I didn't know how to say dice and I had to call my uh, friend in uh, Canada. And uh, I found out the way we say dice is deglu nadio dagwalund. And that means object with eight corners. It's a square, it's a cube. And that made me think that our language has geometry, you know, and a bunch of other things. Of course, the kids didn't want to know that. They just wanted to know when we say the dice, pick up all five of them, put them in the cup, shake them, spill them out and count the, 
you know, count the pips. And uh, I never got to work for pips. And what that brought to me was the need for me to be more uh, uh, involved in the preparation of whatever it is I was going to say with vocabulary because of all the words that went into that, the only one I really knew was cup. And uh, that's hardly a, enough to uh, presume dialogue, but it made me get ready. So, you know, preparing, uh, if you're going to be a facilitator of this is very important, you know, learn the words yourself, unless you already really know them. Um, I thought I knew more than I did. And I came, you know, really face to face that, I have a very limited vocabulary. So you have to learn the vocabulary if you're gonna teach it, uh, or that's where the uh, first language speaker comes in uh, to be very helpful with those phrases and words. Um, I also wanna to mention to anyone listening that um, ILI has some really great uh, books also about uh, doing immersion in the home and how to do some of these activities that uh, you might want to check out on the ILI website. If there's any other questions, get them in quickly. Otherwise, we may be at the end of our Q&A. All right, well, thank you, Jerry. This has been an incredible presentation. I really uh, enjoyed it, and I hope everyone else did. And uh, keep uh, your eyes posted for the next uh, announcements from ILI about uh, what's coming up next. We've got quite a few terrific presenters coming up and I hope you'll join us. Thank you.